We have started a new semester at the Shala where we are going to be studying the book by um, TKV Deskuchar called The Heart of Yoga. Um, one of the books that I hope you guys have in your yoga library, one of the ten books I hope everyone has in their yoga library. And um, the studies this, chap this semester are around, um, I want all of you to have a sense of the history of yoga, not just Ashtanga, but also the history of yoga. So um, we're going to use this book sort of as a framework to look at the sutras and some yoga philosophy. And for starters, today really understanding the lineage and the passing on um, from our teachers. So it, to really start at the beginning would be to understand a little bit and know who Patanjali is. However, we're going to do Patanjali at the end because the sutras are placed at the end of this book, so that's where we're going to talk more about who Patanjali is. So fast forward to Krishnamacharya. Who is Krishnamacharya? Right, for us the relevance begins for us with the fact that he was Patabi Joyce's teacher. He was born in Mysore, India, which is southern India, in Nove on November 18th of 1888, and began his yoga studies. Actually, his father um, was a yoga practitioner as well, which is sort of unusual. And he himself was very um, drawn to yoga and went all the way to the Himalayan mountains to ne Nepal to meet his teacher. Brahmacharya and studied there with him for seven years. When he came back, um, it's sort of interesting too, uh, he chose not to, with his teacher, to live in the Himalayan mountains in a cave somewhere, but instead, um, very relevant to us, he decided to go out, get married, and have a family and teach to the Grihastas. Who are the Grihastas? What are Grihastas? Householders. So again, this is unique in that rather than becoming a sannyasi or a recluse or someone doing yoga, um, almost like out in a monastery or we would think of it somewhere, instead he was like, you know, everyone needs this yoga stuff, so what I want is for you to go out there and teach it to the people that need it and bring it, bring it to them, you know, bring it to a relevance in their life. So. Um, Krishnamacharya held a, a very important place for all of us in that he brought it to, to us to have to be a foundational part and just being able to stay healthy, being parents, being partners to someone, having jobs, kind of maintaining the community, right, through our practice. Um, there's a few things to, I want you guys to know about Krishnamacharya um, and his three really areas of study I think are important to us. The one obviously is yoga. Um, also what was another area for him that was an area that he studied is relevant. Is anybody here on Sunday? He studied Ayurvedic medicine um, and then also um, Sanskrit. Um, he was a Sanskrit scholar and was offered many jobs um, to be a professor but instead chose uh, yoga teaching and traveled really all over India teaching yoga and, um, and also understanding the Sanskrit documents and whatnot. Uh, but the main thing I would like for all of you to be a takeaway from our teacher uh, Krishnamacharya is that he really believed that yoga was medicine. And what he really wanted was to have yoga clinics and to help people heal their illnesses and to stay healthy through the medicine of yoga. So he used all three of those, his, his training in these three disciplines in order to try to heal people through these practices. So when people would come to him for healing, he might give them particular yoga poses, he might give them some breath work, some pranayama, or he might give them a chant to do or something in order to help them or some combination of these three things. And in that, uh, really for us, it, it, it was, um, it was brought to us as yoga being something that keeps us healthy and for all of us becomes medicine, which is fun because last week we were translating the invocation and in that we looked at what the first sloka talks about, this being the Jangali Kayamane, which is the jungle physician, right? And also being our medicine. So when we start our you know, our practice every day when we bring our hands in front of our hearts and do our chant. We're kind of opening ourselves up to the medicine. Um, there are some other things I want you guys to be sort of aware of when it comes to Krishnamacharya because I feel like it's the way that he passed it on to Patabi Joyce, which is how I pass it on to each of you, which is that this practice is meant to be 
um, tailored to you. So even though you're going to be coming in a class today and doing very specific poses with everyone else, it really is about is about you, it's a very personal thing. And so um, Deskachar said when he was talking about his father that he always said, you know, the yoga has to start with where you are. So where you are in one sense is where you all began your yoga practice, like how old you were, what was going on in your body, you know, um, injuries you might have had or sports that you had done prior to it is where you began your yoga practice. But really every time you guys come to your yoga mat is your starting point, where you are today. And it's, it's where you are physically in your body, what's going on with your elbows, what's going on with your back, what's your energy like today from working all day, from being in meetings. Or it might be that you're going through something very traumatic in your life right now. And that's also what we bring um, to the mat every time that we come. So Krishnamacharya and Patabi Joyce um, always set out that you were um, always to take this practice and really evaluate constantly where you are with it every time you do the practice. And um, also for us, uh, we have to constantly look at what's going on and as um, Krishnamacharya said, to practice with intelligence. Actually, Iyengar was very famous for using this word in English, to practice with intelligence, but basically it means to practice with wisdom, right? So while it might be good, we're all gonna um, say at the end of practice, there's a headstand today, right? Maybe a headstand is great for Tamara because she's gonna get her blood flow going a different direction and um, strengthen her arms and her back, but for someone else, you might have cervical, um, disc herniations and so for you doing a headstand at the end of the class is sort of a bad idea right and sometimes I might know that and as your teacher as your light on your path your guide say you know this isn't a good idea for you but there may be things I don't know about the pain that you're having or something that you're going through which again comes back to you being your best teacher and you knowing what is wise in your own practice and constantly kind of again assessing that and playing with with where we need to be within our own practice in that way and um, and you know I always say it's sort of a mantra for us that there is is no competition there's no one to impress there's nothing to prove on our yoga mats so we have to constantly um, look at how we can be in that wisdom and in that intelligence in our own in our own practice um, although there are some other things that we went over on Sunday about Krishnamacharya and how he passed on the practice to all of us I am going to finish with reading you one piece from the end of it which is important to me it's about a guru, since we've been talking about gurus um, being our teacher, someone that sheds light on our path. And this is uh, Deskachar answering a question. A guru is not one who has a following. A guru is one who can show me the way. Suppose I'm in a forest and somehow I've lost my way. Then I'll ask a person, is this the way home? That person might say, yes you go this way and I say thank you and I go my way that is my guru this is an image in the world today that the guru has a following and his students follow him like Pied Piper that is not good the true guru shows you the way you go on your way and then you're on your own because you know your place and you are grateful I can always thank my guru naturally and enjoy the relationship, but I do not have to follow him around because then I am not on my own path. Following the guru's destination is another way of losing yourself. The yoga concept of svad dharma means your own dharma or your own way. If you try to do someone else's dharma, trouble happens. The guru helps you find your own dharma. So I, I love that so much because um, I feel like sometimes we're lucky enough to find a practice that we love and we find a teacher and um, in this particular practice finding a teacher just means it's going to be someone like myself or Tim Miller or Patabi Joyce or whatever who wind up being sort of a guide on your path and showing you the way home. But really for each of you this practice is, um, is your is your choice, is your dharma, and um, and and is your possibility for um, continuing to grow and for transformation, and that is that is a very personal thing, um, and very much a part of um, 
what a good teacher gets to just be sort of walking on the path next to you and, and pointing the way ahead of you sometimes in that. So um, I'm going to finish conference today with one of my favorite quotes by Annie Dillard. She said, I cannot cause light. The most I can do is put myself in the path of its beam. The practices our guru shedding light on our path. May its wisdom and medicine always be transformative. Namaste.